back speaking with Wayne Patterson this morning from Anteris on Just Docs. Wayne, good to see you. Good morning. How are you? Morning, Andrew. I'm good. Good to see you. Look, big updates uh, from you in the last uh, couple of days. So you've raised $23 million at market uh, without discounts. This is for the first time. Just tell us a bit more about the raise. Yeah, I, I, look, I think, you know, yes, it was it was a good raise. Um, certainly for us in the history of Anteris and, and Admetus prior, uh, I don't believe there's been a raise at market or without discount. I think it really speaks to the progress of the company. Obviously, we're uh, in a, a stronger place with this data that's been delivered. And it obviously takes time when you're when you're making a product like this to get to that point. Uh, I think the data is is irrefutable. At this point, there's 30% superiority to the market leader in a very big space, you know, a $15 billion Australian space. So I think that obviously speaks to the fact that there is a significant upside in the company. Uh, it's a function of, of capital. Uh, and, and right now, even, you know, we're, we're down the pointy end of the clinical trials and all that kind of thing. So I think it's just a vote of confidence. And uh, I think it's a justifiable vote of confidence in the company at this, at this moment. Well, Wayne, you mentioned the U.S., early feasibility study demonstrating 30% superiority. Uh, where are you now with the, the FDA on the pivotal study? Yeah, so there's a very specific process here. And, um, you know, the process, and we've worked uh, consistently, of course, with the FDA over the last number of years to get to the EFS study, which was read out in November and December. That's an incredibly important point. It serves as a pilot study to your pivotal. Um, we're at 50 patients now globally, six of those are valve and valve. Uh, all patients are doing exceptionally well. And of course that data remains extremely consistent from that first patient to the last patient so far. Um, there is a process between the EFS and the Pivotal that you have to work through with the, with the FDA. Uh, some of that I can speak to, uh, but of course uh, there's submissions that, that certainly we have made already. You propose the pivotal trial um, protocol, you justify it with biostats, so you've got to make sure the math works, all of that's been done. So we're just in dialogue now, just um, you know, rounding off a few of the edges there and making sure that we're all aligned. But these, these submissions don't just get thrown over the fence. Of course, you have a lot of dialogue before you get there to make sure that everyone is comfortable with what's being proposed. There's lots of precedents for this. And then there's just a process to go through on the FDA timelines to make sure that we're all lined up before you start that study. We're in the middle of that process right now. Well, Wayne, tell us a bit more what the study design might look like. Right. So I think the way to look at this uh, is, as I said, you look at the EFS as a pilot for where you're headed. Uh, now, in that study, um, you know, we got a, a lot of great things agreed to. The key to this study is, you know, how you power statistically the biostats to make sure that it's relevant. But it's a non-inferiority study. Um, I think that's the first key point. Um, and we're looking at a randomized study. So randomized means that some of these patients will be assigned to Juravar, some of them will be assigned to standard of care, which means one of the other Tavar devices that are in the market. Um, and so you can expect 50-50 split on the patient numbers, half of them will be Juravar, half will be standard of care. This gives you good comparative data as well. And on the non-inferiority front, well, as you can imagine, uh, that means you have to be up to the same level as the standard of care. And of course, our data shows something very different to that. Um, and so, you know, once it gets approved, we'll be able to talk more about that uh, and what that study looks like. Just remind us, Wayne, what's the value of the Tebar market? What, what's the opportunity? Right. So the, the forecasts and predictions are interesting. Um, Credit Suisse, UBS, a uh, number of the companies quote the market as being, uh, you know, 15 billion Australian dollars by 2028. Um, and that's not the available market. That's what the sales will actually be. Uh, if we calculate the the TAM, the total available market, it is significantly bigger. And for the reason that um, the number of patients right now really only represents 20, 15 to 20% of the available market. So the treatment and diagnosis is still fairly low and that already equals $15 billion. And on top of this, we've got valve and valve. And of course the valve and valve results for us are, are stunning now. And, and this is a, a real issue as we move forward, we're seeing these, uh, these valves failing in patients uh, and and having to have a replacement valve when they're very sick. So, you know, if we look at that and we know that the patient base is growing or the diagnosis is, is, is appreciating and growing as well. So the if we just do the incidence prevalence modeling on the market, we can see that it's about 30 billion US dollars uh, by 2028. Um, that's the available market. 
And of that, the analysts forecast that we'll get, you know, 10, 10 billion of that in, in patients. This is in the US. So there's a long way to go for this market, even as the predicted market is already very big uh, for actual revenues. Uh, the available market, of course, is three to four times bigger than that. So there's a lot available there. And for a product like Durabar, I think with such differentiated technology, um, clinical superiority and all that kind of stuff, there's obviously a lot of, of room for this product to to grow into a multi-billion dollar product, which of course uh, it, it appears to be when the data is so significantly better than, than current available products. Well, what news uh, is coming up, Wayne? What are your upcoming milestones? Yeah, so obviously a lot. We're um, obviously going through our discussions and dialogue with the FDA. Um, so there'll be some news there, of course, along the way. Um, the AGM is coming up. Um, we are also, uh, of course, progressing on the valve and valve front, more work being done there and more, more patient work being done as well. The objective is to accumulate patients uh, as we move forward by the end of the year um, so that we finish this year uh, somewhere in the range of 75 to 100 patients on Durapar. That's a meaningful number. Uh, and this can happen you know, in or outside of the people's study as well. So we're really trying to get that patient number up. Remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago that they were getting approvals on 100 patients uh, on, the, on the CE side in Europe. Uh, also, our, uh, our mitral project, mitral repair project, which I don't talk about a whole lot because it's, it's so young in, in its development phase, but actually moving into animals as well with that. Uh, very similar to Durabar, we have partnered up with physicians and, and one big, large institution. Um, there is an available market there. There are competitive products there. Um, and we appear to have solved one of the issues with some of those products as well. So we're going to go into animals. It'll move fairly quickly from there. Um, that's, a, again, a multi-billion dollar opportunity. Uh, isn't costing a huge amount of money to develop as well. We're, we're incrementally putting money into that. So quite a lot going on above and beyond Durabar. But of course, the exciting news is as we get through these approvals for our pivotal and start that study, um, you know, then we're heading down the path for commercialization. Great to see you, Wayne. Thanks for your time on Just Docs. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it.